Mission and welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to Peggy's Recovery Corner. We are back again today. Today we have a very special guest. He's a dear, dear friend of mine. He's actually my brother in recovery, if you know what I mean. Um, his name is Louis Offer. Louis, welcome to the corner. Thank you, uh, Pej Corner. <laughs> it's nice to have you and here. Welcome today. to you, too. <laughs> uh, so, Louis, what, what, I'd like to delve into your past. I'd like to uh, talk about who you are, um, you know, where, where you were born, where you were raised, uh, you know, kind of your upbringing, and then what it all turned into. And, and then we'll talk about the recovery on the back end. So, first and foremost, where are you from? Where were you born? You want to know what, like, what set I'm claiming? What set well, are you I, claiming? That's right. Where I'm from? Bring that Lewis oh, man, I, was, I was born in Cedars, Lebanon, eh? <laughs> Cedars, Lebanon. Oh, you mean like in Los Angeles, like Cedar Sinai? Yeah, it's like Cedar Sinai, but it's more like LA, Hollywood area. I think okay. it's Scientology now, maybe. Oh, they changed it? All right. And then. No, no, I think they just took over. It's in Hollywood. So. They so took you, over everything. You were there. born in Hollywood. You are a native Hollywood native. Like there was not many of you. Many either moved no, away. Or no, no, no. I'm a, a Russian Jew. I'm not Native American. I'm not from the Slapaho tribe. Okay, but but you've never been to Russia or Israel, correct? <laughs> that is correct, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a Hollywood resident, and you're to this day you're still in Hollywood, correct? I did a what? So to open your ears, take out the cotton and put it into your mouth. No, you. So you, you don't are, want me to talk now. No, I do want you to talk. My mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your upbringing, growing up in Hollywood. How was it? Um, yeah, I had a charmed life. I actually uh, grew up in Beverly Hills, so it was oh. a little more charmed. Okay, so and, Beverly Hills, uh, just just outside of Beverly Hills, top of Beverly Drive, up by Franklin Canyon. Went to Emerson and Uni. But like I said, I mean, I grew up in the mountains. I had motorcycles, BMX, skateboarding. Started skateboarding in 1970. You know, that was a huge part of my life is the skateboard community. And uh, where were you guys skating back then? Like uh, all over LA? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, hung out in Westwood. But, you know, there used to be these paths on UCLA and Cantor and other schools and had a drainage ditch up the street. And, uh, you know, I was in that generation where we were the first people to get into empty swimming pools and skate them. And I grew up with all the Dogtown guys and I actually worked at Skateboard City right on Barrington in Santa Monica that made the Dogtown boards back in the day. Yeah, old school. That's major old school. I remember skating in pools. That was like the thing to do back back there in the 70s and the 80s. So did you have any siblings? Did I have any? I still do. Oh, you I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I have a brother and sister. I'm the youngest, totally spoiled brat. And okay. uh, there's there was a big uh, uh, age difference, like a few years. My brother and sister were one year and a part and i was like three or four years or maybe more i don't really know how old they are that's not a major age difference usually a major yeah age maybe difference. it's maybe it's yeah usually it'd be five like a months. decade or something okay i'm saying so, yeah. five years well same mom you're, and dad you were the Guys, youngest that, that that beverage you just uh brought out made me thirsty do you mind if i get my coffee real quick get your coffee real quick. go ahead get your coffee all right i'll be right back say hi to the suki hi suki, suki. Oh, yeah, they nice. Yeah, look. Uh, it Suki, was so, Suki, where were you born? Uh, where were you raised at? Could you tell us a little more about yourself? Oh, okay, yeah. You came into Lewis Offer's life at a certain time because you were a rescue. Is that is that correct? Okay, he's back. All right. Okay, watch out, Suki. What does your cup say? I don't know. Wake up and what? Not to read. Wake up and be awesome. Okay, cool. No, right, I just so liked it because it was big. All so, right, Suki, up so up when, now. When you were growing up with, you know, skating and all that, can I ask, were, were kids getting high? Were people drinking, using, anything like that? You thought maybe we weren't? Come on. Okay. As you know me better than that. 
I guess well, you know the the people at home don't know me like that, but that's right. yeah, of of course I was, you know. Okay, and were you? How old do you re recall? How old were you the first time that you ever drank or used, and what was it that you did first? Um. So, well, I'm Jewish, so we drank at these uh, holidays. You know, there was always some Manischewitz that I could sneak. Okay. But uh, my first getting high was, uh, you know what? I was a studio projectionist for 33 years, and I'm out of frame. I, I have to be uh, better framed. Oh, there it is, center frame. Suki's butts in the way. Oh. Sucks. Sorry, this is just like dead air. Um, okay. So I smoked pot when I was 12 years old. I stole some from my brother. Uh, me and my best friend back in the time, Jeff, we went in the bushes. We made a, a homemade pipe. We smoked it. It did absolutely nothing. I did not feel high from it the first time. Mm -hmm. But what I did like, the stealing, the sneaking around, doing something that uh, was against the law. Okay. All right. And uh, you were. this is in your adolescent you were a, a teen at this time? 12. 12, 12. is pre-teen. Once you get 13, then you become a teenager. Okay, at sorry. 13. I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning. <laughs> you, you weren't listening either, huh? <laughs> I was having my drink. And okay, so <laughs> so family life was good. You Let me ask you this. Being Jewish, like were you going to Hebrew school or anything like that? Were you exposed to ma major Judaism? Um. Well, Pej, I got to tell you, I'm just Jewish. I'm not like full blown, like, but I did go to Sunday school for a minute. But none of that happened for you. No, just Jewish. I actually celebrated Christmas when I was a kid because my parents didn't want me to, you know, feel left out. Left out. Okay. Even though you live in LA, which is like massive amounts of Jews. But you still were doing Christmas. Okay, that, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But I did take uh, days off on the Jewish holidays from school. You did. So that was a double winner. Yes, exactly. I got you, Christmas you, and no school on holidays. Quite calculated, I must say. Now, uh, when – so growing up, like, you know, you're hanging out, you're skating, you're doing all the stuff that you're doing at the time. Um, did, did drugs and alcohol become a problem? Did you get into heavier stuff, like uh, heavy drugs? Well, I'm 58 years old, so I grew up in the era of quaaludes, and those are just the greatest thing. I literally took thousands of quaaludes. And, uh, Why? Why would you take those? What would they do to you? Um, numb and tingly, and just like, you know, spontaneously, instantly, like, <laughs> uh, I just liked the way that felt. There was a lot of sex happening, and uh, it was just a, a great, great time. Um, I mean that era, it was like Hollywood era, you know, was when you say a lot of sex, as in like sex parties, or you were just having sex oh, with no, no, women? Yeah, I mean, not so much parties, but there were, you know, times where there's more than one person or two people in the room. Mm -hmm. um, uh oh, that's a newcomer. All right. Did I lose you? No, I'm right here. You, All you right. Just well, my screen talk. went. Sorry, I can't talk right now. How do, how do I get it? It's all right. If he drinks, he drinks. I, just, I hope one's going to six sense me. He knows who Bez, to call. How do I get you back, back on? Um, you're already friend. on. Don't even worry about it. Don't worry about no, it. You're but okay. I can't see. I want to well, be able to see. I don't know what you did. It's probably because your I, newcomer called you and it's hooked up to your phone and your computer. Oh, there it yeah. is. I just need to press uh, the Google. The Google, exactly, or the but Facebook. now I have like a little Facebook. Somebody, yeah, I have a little thing up here. I'm gonna get rid of it. Click, bam. So, all right, were, sorry. So, so were you ever diagnosed with ADD or ADHD or HDTV or anything like that? Um, no, I never did any AD and D security or anything like that. But uh, <laughs> Woo! I knew today was gonna be good. Now, question for what, you. What's Good um, You're cutting no, out. No, I, I do have dyslexia, and oh. um, I did end up uh, doing the fifth grade twice. Okay. See, that's I said twice, and I held up one finger. That's why I had to do it <laughs> twice. 
<laughs> okay. But uh, I did have to go to like some special schools because I had a, a reading problem and writing problem. All right. Like Frost, Renault, UES, weird schools where I looked into weird machines. And I don't even know if they knew what dyslexia was back then. By the way, if you have dyslexia, that's uh -huh. how you say it, dyslexio. <laughs> okay. So now when you – as far as school was going, like were you doing – were you even achieving in school, like in high school? Were you going to school? Were you cutting classes? What were you doing? Dude, I, uh, I went to West Hollywood uh, Elementary School, right? like by the Roxy and the rainbow there just below on Hammond. Uh -huh. And um, they started busing back then. So that was interesting. And, you know, it's right by the sunset strip. Mm -hmm. So there was Watergate dog, which was a pinball arcade that we hung out at yeah. right down the street was psychedelic conspiracy was a head shop. Uh -huh. And uh, one time I came home with this little booklet of hundred dollar bills it turned out they were rolling papers. I'm a little huh. kid. I didn't know what that was. So right. I was definitely exposed to drugs and alcohol at an early age. And mm -hmm. that wasn't the question you asked me. You asked me about schooling. And yeah. yeah, then I went to Emerson and then I went to uni high and, you know, uni high had an open campus. I took horticulture a lot because we'd just take roll and split and uh, we'd go to picks for breakfast. We'd go to catchies for lunch and, you know, just come back high and late. And we used to, you know, I had history and come in late to that and said, better late than straight. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> now, did you, did you finish totally school? On, something different now. Did you finish school on time? Like, I mean, did you? Yeah, did you yeah. Graduate? Well, I, I, like I said, I stayed back the, the fifth grade, but uh, yeah, I graduated. You know, you graduated. I, I wasn't good at the reading and writing, but I was good at participating in class. I knew what was going on. I can answer questions. I also was in a alternative program in high school called SWAS, uh -huh. a school within a school, or as right. we like to call it, study with a stoner. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, I just had a 40-year uh, like non-official uh, high school reunion. That was nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. You went to it? You actually went to yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was just at Rancho Park. is very informal. And, uh, you know, people, people already know what I look like and what I'm about. So they're all right. right. And they we'll get shocked. to that in a second about what you look like, because obviously uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So uh, cocaine, wasn't cocaine in your mix? I think I remember you were doing some, you told me you were doing some yay back oh, then. Oh, yeah. You you want to hear my, uh, uh, when the coke was gone, me picking my nose and eating my coke booger story, huh? <laughs> I mean, Not really. Like talking about <laughs> no, I don't, but I did. It sounds like you just talked about it anyway. Yeah. I mean, you, you briefed over it. Yeah, no, I mean, cocaine was definitely a, a huge thing. Look, I'll just tell you what, what I did. So somebody uh, there, you like to I, say? No, I, I was just seeing if this door was open over here. I wanted to shut it, but it's closed. <laughs> Go ahead. Where, where, where's your menagerie? What do you have, three dogs and a cat? That's right, I do, but... Yeah, let's, yeah. Let's, You're not let's, not, let's not get off the subject of the cocaine. So you were getting into coke. Oh, okay. I was going to tell you a little bit about. So I smoked pot all day. I drank and took pills, the quaaludes, all night. And then I would smoke and snort cocaine all morning on a daily basis for Where years. Where were you living? Different places. I lived uh, in West LA. For with the family or, or with, with friends? Yeah. I, did, I didn't move out of my house until I was 25. Then I. I uh, moved in with a friend of mine, James Derry, who's passed away. And he was a Coke dealer and I was a pot dealer. So we always had uh, plenty of party favors. That's and right. uh, nice. and uh, he moved one block one way and I moved one block the other way. And now I'm right across the street from the police station right there on uh, Butler. And I'm on Colby in Iowa. And I'm literally across the street. I'm by myself. I'm all coked out. I'm, you know, after that first hit of coke I took, I put a towel down on the door, my surfboard, snowboard, boogie board, skateboard against the door to barricade it, mm -hmm. spray Lysol after every hit, and spent a lot of time on the, I could talk to people at the front door and yeah. I could listen. So I spent hours listening to my front door because the cops were out there. 
And at that time, they really were. They really but were. Okay. Later, they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you said you lived at home till you were 25 years old. How old were you when you got sober? I was 29. And oh. after living uh, on, on my own and with James for about four years, I moved back to my folks' house. It's a nice house, and my mom would make me breakfast and do my laundry, and, you know, it's a great area. But uh, I got sober, and after shortly after I got sober, they kicked me out because I couldn't keep my room clean. And some things haven't changed. I don't keep my apartment clean. (laughs) Maybe we'll get into that if I feel a little more vulnerable. I could talk about my hoarding. You might want to write some notes down to, uh, you know, to go back to uh, later on. Um, well, back up real quick. Why? Why? Okay, you got sober at twenty nine. You moved out at twenty five. Um, did I mean you were actively using while living at home up until twenty five years old, right? So, did your mom or dad know about this stuff? Like, did they ever come and like tell you? Why are you quaaluded out and passing out? Like, did they? Was there any episodes? I, of course, there was tons of it. I mean, I had curfews that I would, you know, never make. I, you know, had several uh, stents at the hospital. You know, what was happening? Why, why would you go to the hospital? Um, maybe doing too much drugs, having bad reactions. One time, I fell roller skating and. Something happened where I only said the same three things over and over, and I had to get a CAT scan. Um, wow. You know, uh, and, and also, uh, you know, not only picking me up from the hospital, but from the police station. So right. there was a lot of that. You know, uh, I pretty much ran amok. There wasn't so, uh, what do they call that, where the parents just don't really take care of free range uh, yeah. parenting, maybe? Yeah. That's, uh, you know, I just did whatever I want. I was, you know, they really couldn't control me. I was out of control. You were having run-ins with the law because you uh, got arrested for being under the influence or were you committing crimes? Uh, more crimes. I mean, I, I had detectives come to my house because I burglarized a bike shop. I also had a strong arm robbery. I beat up some kid and took his skateboard, um, you know, drug dealing another time um i was shooting uh at a wrist rocket and pachinko balls and i was shooting out car windows and buses and uh i got popped for that one uh had a brandishing you're you know, kind of a bad boy i'm a nice jewish boy what are you talking about <laughs> what do you think it was that made you go down this path were your brother and sister like that or were you just a little rebel or what was it I, I, I really uh, cannot tell you exactly what it was. You know, maybe my environment, the people I was hanging out with. Um, sure. Yeah, I would These, say that was it. Were they, were they like Beverly Hills kids or just like kids from- No, I, I hung out in Venice a lot. You like, you were, you're, I mean, I know right now you're to this day, you're, I, I, I'll say this comfortably, you're kind of an icon in Venice because- um, because of who you are, you've, you've, you've been in Venice for a long time on again, off again. I know you live in Hollywood and you, you're a world travel or you a country traveler now, but, um, uh, as far as Venice beach back then, like, obviously there was a lot of drugs, uh, in the sixties, the seventies and the eighties, right? Yeah, of course there was. And you were just kind of living up that LA lifestyle, the, the party lifestyle. Yeah, going to clubs, you know, big parties, house parties, you know, right. Right. After hour parties, just All party, body, body. Right. Uh, when you, when you, uh, you said that you got sober at 29. Why did you get sober? Um, so I was back at my parents' house, lived up in the hills, had a big uh, A frame uh, ceiling with huge triangular glass windows that I spray painted black, except for a little people spent hours thinking the police were outside. They're in their helicopter. They're in their ninja outfits. They got their MP5 coming. But a bit of powder that I had that was so sweaty from holding it, and I got super paranoid. But what started happening was I started getting chest pains. My arm was going numb, and I was twitching a lot. And uh, I knew those were 
signs of heart attack. And I really felt that I was going to die if I kept doing what I was doing. I, I didn't feel it. I knew it. Mm. And uh, that's that's what it took for me. I came in on a New Year's resolution, came in, did marijuana maintenance. I told people I was smoking pot still, didn't do anything else until five months later, did everything one more time. And that's what it took for me to surrender and stop doing everything. So when you say you came in, like, you did you go to rehab? Did you just uh, quit on your own and go and uh, – and, uh, go to like a 12 step group. What made you, did you have to detox anywhere? By the way, Alana Downey says, tell the truth. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you for your input. And um, she, also, she also says, hi, Suki. Uh, um, Pej. Yes. And when she writes, it just comes across the whole bottom of my screen. I know. See, hi, Suki. Hi, I'm Suki saying, again. I can read that. Right I have dyslexia, but I can read. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks for translating. <laughs> Appreciate you. Love. Uh, what was the question again? Um, shit. No, I, I don't feel it. bad. You don't remember either. No, I remember. Oh, no, I didn't go to rehab. I uh, to rehab? I actually went to Cocaine's Anonymous. Okay. It's not Cocaine's. It's just Cane. It's singular, not <laughs> no, plural. Just, just Cocaine, not Cocaine's. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I caught it and corrected it, but it, it sounds kind of cool, Cocaine's Anonymous. <laughs> um <laughs> Oh, and uh, and then uh, I found AA, and that's where I've been ever since. Not that I don't go back to Cocaine Anonymous or whatever Anonymous it is. Okay, it's all all good. And at the time, like in 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 LA, there was plenty of meetings and all that to go to. Yeah. All right. Truth is, Pez, there was a lot more hot chicks in the AA. Not that there wasn't hot girls in in CA, but somebody took me to that Rodale meeting. I'm like, man, this is it. And okay. then I found late night. Late night in Hollywood. Yeah. Question for you. So uh, as far as your get down, like you, you've got your certain, there's a persona, right? Like everybody knows Lewis Offer because he's the guy with the devil horns. And, and you've, you know, I, I've seen pictures of you uh, before. Naked. <laughs> Not naked. No. Oh, <laughs> well, maybe, I, I mean, half naked, <laughs> but I've seen pictures of you from, before when you had black horns and a, and a black goatee. Now, how did this all take form? Like, did you become, was this happening when you were still using and drinking or did you just, did this persona uh, come about in your recovery? I'm going to answer that question now. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I did in sobriety. I actually, I'll tell you a little story uh, behind the whole thing. Okay. Is I used to have beautiful long blonde hair. When I was a kid, I was really cute. I think I was. I mean, uh, chicks like me. Uh, I, I, you know, it's kind of narcissistic. You're, you're in super good shape. I've seen like your body was really buff. Like you were like probably going to muscle. I'm not anymore. <laughs> um, no, I wasn't in buff or super good shape. But I've seen. I, I, uh, I used to be cute. I used to have long blonde hair, skater okay. kind of yeah. kid. Yeah. Um, I started losing my hair in high school okay. and uh, I started to uh, uh, comb it up into a pompadour right. for a long time. I had a pompadour. I mean, I wasn't really into rockabilly, but it was, I like it, you know, so it worked. And uh, um, and then uh, I, I wore a rug for a minute. What, and, what does uh, that mean? What's uh, like a, a, a toupee? You wore a toupee? Yeah, it was like on this really fine mesh and they glued it down. I didn't do it too long. My friend paid for it and kind of did it as a dare or whatever. I'm like, well, yeah, I'll do it. I'm high. I don't care. But the thing <laughs> is, when you have a piece of carpeting glued to your head and you're doing a lot of cocaine, uh -huh. I really couldn't stop picking at that glue while I was all coked out. <laughs> um, so that didn't go too good. Then I shaved my head. Uh -huh. And then uh, for Halloween, I, I grew the horns out. And this was probably 27, yeah, probably about 27 years ago. And okay. I like the attention. I My name really is Lewis Offer. I was going to get to that. So so it's not, a lot I of people they put, a lot of people think, oh, he just named himself Lewis Offer to sound like Lucifer. So like, that was, that was just 
that you really are Lewis Offert on paper. Yes. My full name is Lewis Norton Offer. People do not change their name to Norton. Okay? <laughs> Unless they're like really big honeymooner fans, then they might. But And I do happen to live on Norton Street. Great. Yeah, and I, I, I think you told to me that. when you were doing cocaine, some people may have said something like Snorton Norton. That's right. That's a good one. <laughs> I, the late, great Kevin Hope. Used to call me Snort and Norton. Snort and Norton. Okay, so Lewis Offer, and uh, you've you had the horns. They were just black for that Halloween event. I I think so. In the beginning, they were black. I definitely my goatee was black for a long time, but the horns were red most of, always. So when I say you you you're kind of an icon, I mean in the recovery community, a lot of people see listen, you. Pesh. You keep saying this. I never conned anybody out of anything. Icon. <laughs> <laughs> don't think I don't know your humor. I know you too well. We've yeah, gone back. I'm, I'm a dad, dad joke guy. Yeah. So, Pej, if you have a bee in your hand, what do you have in your eye? What? Beauty, because beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Oh, my God. <laughs> they just get worse. Oh, man. Your dad jokes are wait, starting. Wait, wait. Somebody in the background laughed. <laughs> that's my that's my cat. <laughs> oh. so your dad terrible. jokes are starting to become kind of like grandpa jokes, but you're not even a grandpa. But still, I mean, you're the age of somebody's yeah. grandpa. Anyway, okay. So with that said, um, why did you take recovery so serious? Like, why did Lewis Offer stay sober? Well, I was miserable when I was getting loaded. I didn't know it because it's all I knew. Okay. You just had a little drive-by. <laughs> no, that's no, it's a very distracting young man when I'm trying to talk and you just walk right <laughs> by the screen. Do you do that at meetings when the guy's speaking? You just get up and walk right in front of him? He doesn't go to meetings. He's a normal Oh, well, then feel free to just keep walking by as you will. <laughs> okay, now. Sorry. Um, you asked now, me a question. I got distracted. I'm easily distracted. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, what this was Lexo, the Dyslexo people get distracted too, don't they? Yeah, I got uh, AT and T. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really have like T-Mobile. It's actually the most we've laughed on this this particular show. Okay, so uh, you took it seriously because you were miserable. Was there oh, any yeah, yeah, yeah. So what what happened? Thank you. I, I forgot where we were. Um, is I started feeling good and I started having fun and I was going to these late night meetings and I had a community. And, and it felt good, you know, and I liked the feeling. It took me a while to really get comfortable being comfortable, but, mm -hmm. but I, I something happened to me right. where, where I enjoyed being sober. I didn't know that I would enjoy being sober because I never was. Would it be fair to say that you took sobriety by the horns? No, you, you know, I... I <laughs> I like to blow my own horn, but I don't really work that hard at this thing. You know, I'm not right. like a great AA member. I'm not doing podcasts or sober houses. Or Actually, you're, you're doing a podcast today. So, or, yeah. And, and, no, no, I don't do one. I'm doing yours. Oh, you're um, doing your own. Okay, okay. So, yeah, I really um, I don't do a lot. I, I'm one of those people that does very little and gets a lot of credit. Okay. And, but one thing I have done really well is I've been very consistent. I've always gone to a lot of meetings, a lot of service. And, um, yeah, we'll probably get more into that if you ask that question. We should get into that. So as far as working and stuff, were you um, – before you were sober, were you working – didn't you work in the entertainment business or something like that for a while? Yeah, 33 years. But okay. – uh, yeah, I was a projectionist. I ran film, and I did that before sobriety. I actually was working at a producer's home showing movies on the weekend for him, mm -hmm. and it was great because I, I got by on that. And uh, one, one time I came to work stoned, and he let me know. And, and I, um, had a matter-of-fact way that was not okay. And this was a man that I had – have a huge amount of respect for. He was like a, still alive, like yeah. a second father to me. 
And when he said that was not okay, uh, I took it serious and okay. was yeah. one of the reasons why I got s sober mm -hmm. was because of uh, the my, respect you had for him. Yeah. My parents didn't really care. You know, I, I told my mom not long before I got sober that I had a cocaine problem. She said, no, you don't. No, you don't. I'll make you a egg McMuffin. And <laughs> I mean, as a but good, they, Jew they, they knew I mean, as a I good Jewish mother would just sweep it under the rug. You don't have a problem. It's okay. It'll yeah. work itself out. Yeah. They, they, they knew that I drank and smoked pot. Yeah. And one thing I, I didn't really talk about, which I should, is I smoked a lot of angel dust. So maybe that's some of the reason why I'm the way I am. I, I could actually hear my brain cells popping when I smoked that. Um, wow. And, and it was very inexpensive, and I did it, you know, probably a couple hundred times, as well as acid and mushrooms and a lot of other things as well. You know, a lot of other pills and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so <clears throat> let's get into the recovery portion. So you, you got sober, you got serious, and you got into service. I think this is what counts. It's what matters. Yeah, when I was new, I you know, I had this big Cadillac and I used to go to the recovery houses and pick up new guys and load them up and take them to meetings. I also, my sponsor at the time had me get a commitment outside the program and I did a volunteer work at LAYN, Los Angeles Youth Network. And uh, I would go once a week and uh, drive their van to Costco and get supplies and hang out with the kids. And they called me the undercover staff because they didn't know if I was one of them or a staff. And uh, but you were just doing it to be a service to just like help out. No, my my sponsor made me do it. I'm not, I'm not like helping people because I want to help people. Yeah. But oh, you probably then, did that so you want to be. Once I started sober. doing that, I found yeah. that's where I get the buzz around here. That's ah. where I get to do something that makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. So it's Suki, so stop eating your food. <laughs> Just like crunching <laughs> in the background. Tell the dog not to eat it. <laughs> we we can't hear the dog. Let let Suki do what Suki's doing. Uh, so, do you want to talk about Earl? Earl came into your life in your in your sobriety, correct? Yeah, yeah. You know, I I've gone through a few sponsors, and uh, they were all great, except one. And uh, Earl had one time said something to me i think it was at the 7-eleven on Sotel that uh something to the fact that you're not really part of aa unless you do the steps uh had, i can't quote not, him had you not done them yet at the time no and and i had four years sober i'd done one twos and threes i'd done some fours and fives but i never wanted to do that nine step because i stole a lot and I didn't want to have to give my money to anyone. Later, I found out I didn't have to. It wasn't to. your money. <laughs> I just had to return their money to them. <laughs> and, and most of the time, people said, dude, don't worry about it. You know, I'm glad you're sober. Keep going to those meetings and stay away from me. Um, Did Earl but, tell you this because he heard you like at a meeting saying something like, that. We we ran in the same circles. We'd see each other and whatnot, and uh, you know, it, maybe it was common knowledge, or maybe he heard me share it. Who who knows? But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't trying to hide it, um, and, and uh, it wasn't until I did all twelve steps that I really felt comfortable and I really felt part of AA. So anyhow, I think Earl was speaking at Rodeo, and afterwards, I came up and asked him. And uh, yeah, sometimes he talks about that. He does. He says, he says in some of his he, uh, chats. He says, "If the devil asked me to to help him out, then I must be that I don't know what I'm doing here." Like yeah, basically, what I'm putting out there. What I'm putting out there. So, and and as far as your persona as, as being a devil, because a lot of people see you. That you got flames tattooed on the back of your legs. You got uh They they go all all the way around. Right. Right. Oh, there, there like they are. That. Okay. And then you got the red beard, and you now, I mean, you transitioned from a black beard and, a, and black horns to red. That's that's very devilish of you. And But if people get to know you, like, there's nothing evil about you. 
You're just a well, fucking. That's not true, Pez. There's there's plenty of evil. If you could hear what goes on in my head, you know, <laughs> for the most part, you know, I try to spike Lee it out and do the right thing, but I still have bad thoughts and and I'm easily annoyed and I think about doing violent things and uh-huh. you know I don't act on most of that stuff, but like that I can snap. Yeah. I just returned a microwave yesterday because it started electrocuting inside <laughs> and they told me I need to go home and clean it and bring it back. And I was like, not happy with that. Right. <laughs> but uh, you know what? I went out to, to the van and I cleaned it and I brought it back and I apologized and uh, I got a new microwave. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I know that back in the day when you, you and Earl started running in the same circles, my sister also met you guys. So you've known her longer than you've known me. I met you probably 2014. So it's been, you know, about eight years ago. I didn't realize that we would end up becoming sobriety brothers, but it was cool because we would hang out together a lot. I think one of the things that was most, that, that touched my heart the most in, in seeing your interactions was um, your service work. I think this is a big deal to talk about this a lot. I do believe that um, when we are in recovery, we're not really in recovery unless we are practicing the principles in all of our affairs and giving it away. And I see you do that. So we had a friend um, who you were helping mainly. Her name was Nikki, God rest her soul. But um, one of the things that stood out to me, the very, very, mo- by the way, Gila says, yay and. Oh, that you. only comes up there when you put it up there. Yeah, I love you both. So, so there's much. other people talking that I don't see. Oh, there's a lot of people talking. There's Bass Dog saying nice. I hope they're talking shit. Paul, Paul says, sub fellow. Sagittarius, Sagittarius, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lewis looks great. Congratulations on your recovery from Susan. Okay. Uh, Let's get back yeah. to me. Enough of them. Okay. 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 <laughs> so we, we kind of, before we move, move on to like what I do to stay sober and service and whatnot, kind of gloss over the Earl thing. And I'd like to talk a little bit about more about, sorry, Earl, because a man saved my life. Tell me about that. So, Why? so grateful. Well, I probably wouldn't have stayed sober just going to meetings and being of service. Hmm. And, um, you know, Earl, Earl took me through all 12 steps and, uh, you know, was is my mentor and somebody who I really look up to, I admire, I want what he has, you know. Like sometimes people say, hey, you know what? You remind me of Earl. Like, what you say and what you do reminds me of Earl. And that's like the biggest compliment uh, anybody can give me. And Earl, I don't know if he still does, but he would talk about, you know, he's a circuit speaker and he would go all these exotic locations and talk about sponsoring Satan. So Mm -hmm. I'd get people coming up to me. Ain't you that, that, that chap, that, that bloke Earl's talking about and get stuff like that at, at conventions. And, you know, I, I had, uh, um, a little AA celebrity hood through Earl. <laughs> kind of like I sponsor um, the biggest, probably the biggest rapper in the world. He, he's like 6'10", 6'11". He's, he's right. a big, big rapper. Danny Boy O'Connor. And it's like any bit of coolness I have is me being connected to him and me being connected to Earl. And mm-hmm. by the way, Danny's killing it. Little little plug here for DB is uh he bought this house in Tulsa, Oklahoma that the movie uh, Outsiders was filmed. Oh, nice! And uh, turned it into a museum. And I thought, man, you're crazy doing that. How are you gonna move to Tulsa and do this? And uh, it's incredible. They've done a documentary about him. He's in magazines and papers. Now that the pandemic's getting better, people are like coming. And he's really doing great. He's just, you know, such a, a wonder, wonderful man. And He's a good dude. And, and to know that I had a little bit to do with that makes me feel so good, man. I love that. I and love that, that. That's, that's the deal. You know, it's like we, we all in the recovery community have the unique ability to save somebody's life that – a doctor, a police officer, a lawyer, a judge doesn't have. 
We have that bond like people have survived a shipwreck, like it says in the book. So mm -hmm. we can talk to each other because we share that common bond and listen mm -hmm. to each other. When it's like a doctor says, oh, your liver's extended. If you drink, you're going to die. I'm like, F you, cop. Don't tell me what to do. I kind of pull the reins in. I'm not a big swearer, but I, I kind of set my finger in some I have. I've heard you say a lot of fucking bad words. Don't act like Yeah, I try not to. Don't act like you're an angel. It's like filler to me. It's like, if you don't have any say, say, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> F that, F that. You know, it's like, I'd rather, yeah. Look what Daniel Mark Berger is saying. Louie H. I love that guy. I've known him since I was man, a kid. Okay, so another thing. <clears throat> I love the emotions that you show when it comes to Earl. Earl saved my life, too. He truly did. Having him in our lives is, you so know. It's a big deal. It's a, it's, it's a big deal. It's a big Not, deal. I trust anything. that man with my life. I was drowning. I said, hey, Earl, can you throw me a life preserver? And he did it. And he, I you grabbed many, it and he reeled me in to the boat. You know how many countless people have come to me and told me, uh, you know, I was in a group in rehab. I was thinking about going and relapsing. Somebody came and played some Earl Hightower CD and uh, and it changed my life. And it made me decide, like, if that guy could make it, then I could make it. I actually had him on here before. He is he is a beautiful man. Um I want to talk about our friend Nikki that passed away back in the day. Um, Nikki was, I used to see her with you. Sometimes she'd come in the room and uh, you could tell she wasn't well, but, but there was a side of the, her that really wanted to be well. Like she really, she really was attempting to stay sober. And um, I remember it was a time when um, she was in and out, in and out, but it had come down to basically she was living in Hollywood pretty close to your house and she would uh, go out of her way to, even though being on Vivitrol, she would still go down to downtown and pick up heroin and shoot it. And she was shooting it uh, in her neck. And I remember I'd have conversations with her and often I'd ask like, how are you even doing this if you're on Vivitrol? Because th that's supposed to take the cravings away. And she goes, Pej, I'm not even doing this to get high anymore. I'm just doing this because I want to die. That's right. And um, and in the end, she died. Yeah. So you pretty much told the Nikki story for me. Nikki lived a half a block away. Mm -hmm. And Nikki was a horse trainer. She had a special connection with animals. My dog, Suki, loved her more than she loves me. They have a special bond in every time... We walk by her uh, place. Suki tries to pull in, in to her door. Might have something to do with one time I went over there when she was dog sitting for me. And Suki was actually sitting in a chair on the kitchen table with the steak, a plate, uh, a plate full of steak that she was feeding her chunk at a time. So uh, I might have had something to do with it. But she, she, her and Suki's relationship was amazing. Our relationship was amazing. We spent just about every single day for a year and a half together. And what I was trying to show her is that we can have fun around here. You know, being sober is not miserable. The thing with Nikki was that she had a lot of ghosts from her past that she just could not work through and tried as hard as I could. You know, other people tried and tried and she just couldn't get over that childhood trauma. And I understand it because I see a lot of it. You know, there's a lot of people that come into the program with trauma mm -hmm. and use drugs and alcohol to self-medicate. Right. And I'm getting the echo again. Do you have your phone on? No, there's no echo. Okay. It's just me, man. Uh, sorry, that's going to take you a second to get you're old enough to get after yeah. the bunny. Um, it just wasn't funny. Sorry talking about something serious and that's something I do when things get serious. I like to interject humor. It's just who I am. So you trauma, you take away the medicine, the self medicating, and you're stuck with that stuff, that stuff sometimes too powerful. And that's mm -hmm. kind of why we do these 12 steps is to work through all that uncover, discover, and discard. And, um, 
but sometimes people you take away their drugs and alcohol and they're stuck with those feelings and it's too much for them and they end up killing themselves and yes nikki would say that i don't use to get high i used to die and she got her wish she um her her roommate came that night was yelling in front of my house i went up there she was dead the coroner, the sheriff, everybody, I had to deal with them and because the roommate was just too frantic. And I had to watch her be wheeled out in the gurney in the body bag. And and it was one of the most painful things I've ever had to gone go through in my life, seeing that. Cause because I really loved that girl. I mean, we would just sit in bed watching the boys and you know, there was nothing going on with us other than just you know, yes. friendship and, and love and one person trying to help another person. She was and awesome. She was an awesome, awesome woman. I miss yeah. her. I miss yeah, her. Me too. Sorry. Oh. So how about those Raiders? <laughs> I don't know. I just to change the subject. <laughs> they got hey, to do, Edge, do you know what you get when you teach a wolf how to meditate? What? A werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man it never gets old with you no. oh if you don't hang out with me enough it gets old really quick and it's <laughs> one of my friends you've heard my jokes over i used and over to hang out with you all the time and i've been living yes. in la i've been living in la for two almost two years now again and you don't even you haven't always, seen you once you're like a traveling wilbury yeah, I did get that that van and, and cruising around a little bit. You've been retired for a while, right? You you've I've been been retired for nine years. You know, everything uh went digital, so there's not very much film being ran. Right. And yeah. uh, you know, like I said, I worked thirty-three years, I saved money, the money's been making money, I've been able to live off my dividends. I have a rent control apartment that I got from being of service in a in a a, a in the A and A. Uh -huh. And are we allowed to say AA here? Is it just a 12-step I mean, program? You've, you've been sp talking about AA for the last Well, I could just say 12-step program and, the, you know. And I say 12-step program because I don't want to ever ruin anybody's anonymity. But Yeah, yeah. So I somebody, should say that. I mean, no, if, if you program. want to talk about it, yeah, that's. that's so it's in, in the level of press, radio, and films, and podcasts. Yeah, and, and, face, and the Facebook. And the Facebook. Man, you're as old as me. You put a thumb in front of it. Oh, I only say it because you say it. I love oh, it. Damn it. Yeah, okay. um, Sorry. So so now you're 29 years sober. When do you turn 30? Uh, June 3rd, 1992 is my sobriety date. And I, I'm uh, 58 years old. And we were saying something before that that I didn't quite finish because I do that often. I just segue into something else and forget yeah. about what I was talking about. No, I'm just I'm, – I'm really stoked to have you on here. I mean, I've always – I've known your story. I've heard it in various talks and we've talked. Is that it? Are we, are we over now? Are you shutting it down? I mean, no. Do you have anything more that you would like to talk about? Where's the hope? Tell us like something that's hopeful for the, I mean, you've kind of said it all already, but for the suffering addict or alcoholic, like what, what would you recommend? We have a time limit on this. It was getting boring. People want to leave. What's, what's up? <laughs> I'm getting Do I need to sing and dance? Hello, my baby. Hello, my <laughs> darling. Hello, my ragtime. Um, so I want to tell you about my apartment. I was, okay. I was at a, I was like I was saying earlier. I was getting kicked out of my parents' house. I needed to go apartment hunting. My friend Andrea was supposed to look with me. I couldn't get a hold of her. A new guy calls me up, Chris Johnson. He says, "Hey, can you give me a ride to the Radford meeting at noon?" I said, "Sure." Mm. give him a ride. I was like, Oh, I was supposed to go apartment, honey. So that's funny. You say that because I moved from my apartment to the one above me. And my landlord asked me if I knew any, uh, buddy that, uh, would rent that apartment. And I came in here for $500 and, uh, I, I now pay $659 for a bedroom at Santa Monica and Crescent Heights, a one bedroom with parking free hot water. To live in the, in the heart of Hollywood at that cheap of a rate. Wow. Yeah, twenty two fifty is what my apartments are going for, like mine here. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, just everything good in my life is a direct result of being of service in Alcoholics Anonymous. 
which I hear people say, I don't know that everything is, but definitely that apartment is. Mm -hmm. um, what else do I want to talk about, Lila, before you shut me down? I love my life. You know, I, uh, like I said, I've been retired for nine years and I haven't really done much. This whole pandemic thing, I was very comfortable with. I enjoy staying home. I have a bidet seat. I have a Berkey water filter. I have more <laughs> pods of coffee than I know what to do with. And, and I was set. I mean, I didn't need toilet paper, water, or coffee. I had it all. And, and I got the bug out van too. So if I need to go, I can go. But, Are you still uh, an Amazon uh, addict slash? Yeah, I I, I enjoy order. Amazon. It's uh, Amazon has changed my uh, my motto. You know, people used to say, "Hey, Louie, how you doing?" I say, "I'm doing good." It doesn't do any good to complain. People just think you're a whiner. But I've had to change it to, "I'm doing good." It does a lot of good to complain to Amazon because they will give you five dollars towards something they sell mm -hmm. if their your package is late or anything wrong with it. So. I don't want to tell people that because then they'll do it and then they'll stop doing it for me. Too late. <laughs> oh, I love oh, it. Man, my fear of elevators is escalating. <laughs> Wait, that wasn't the joke. The joke was my fear of movie steps is escalating. <laughs> Sorry, I combined two jokes into one and it okay. came out hybrid. I love you, Lewis. Man, you're you're one of a kind. Ain't nobody like you. I'm yeah, telling you. Yeah, you know, um, and and I'll tell you, you know, a little over two years ago, I had a micro stroke. I was talking mm -hmm. on the phone. And I was trying to say three piece suit, and I I couldn't talk, and I just didn't know what was going on. I got really scared. And, uh, my friend Kevin ended up next day taking me to the hospital, and they told me I had this thing called a micro stroke, uh -huh. and uh, it put things in perspective for me. You know that. Yeah, you know, I could 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 die. You know, they say it, it could be a sign for a bigger stroke. And my uh -huh. dad's had a stroke. And um, were you under stress or something? I mean, how'd that happen? No, I don't I'm like so. You don't seem stressed. like you're under any stress. I don't even know why. <laughs> well, I, I, have, I have no job. Sanitary? I have no girlfriend. I have no worries. Right. Um, yeah, no, it wasn't wasn't bad. But um, you know, I bought that camper van. And um, I guess that's what people do when they retire. So I'm looking forward to uh, doing some more traveling. I just took a trip up to Seattle along the coast, and it was amazing. I'm going to do Route 66 next and national parks and, and whatnot. And I started a YouTube channel. My best friend is this guy, Mike, and he has a YouTube channel, German in Venice, and he's really popular. And sometimes he would put me in his videos and people would ask, what's up with the devil guy? So I started my own YouTube channel now. And it's just what's Lewis it Offer. Just it's Lewis, Lewis Offer. Offer, my name. Okay. You know, if, if you're really good at it, you don't need a gimmicky name. It's just your name. I don't know that to be true. <laughs> um, but I'm pretty much just riding on his coattails. And, you know, that's been fun making some silly videos, some travel videos. I went out on Rodale. Uh, Sunday and asked people if they wanted to pop bubble paper. <laughs> we had some fun. And, you know, I, I obviously I don't take myself too serious, but I do take my sobriety serious. And, you know, I've been fortunate. A lot of people have I've been able to sponsor a lot of people throughout my 29 years of sobriety. And, and I take that very seriously, you know, and I sponsor women and you know, if somebody's drowning and they want help, I don't say, well, I only uh, throw life preservers to men or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, we're all doing the best we can with what we got. And, you know, I just, if you guys didn't get this, you know, from me, I love my life. Any day above ground's a good day. And I really, you know, I well up a lot because I do have such a wonderful life and wonderful friends and you know, the things that were so important to me before the money and the girls are not important to me now. I mean, yeah, I would like to have a girlfriend, but I don't. I got a nice dog. And, and if I'm going to be a bachelor for the rest of my life, I'm going to be the happiest bachelor I can. Mm -hmm. But I truly love my life. I am, I'm just charmed. I have a Corvette. OK, guys like me don't have Corvettes. 
which by the way, somebody keyed the other day is in the shop. Men don't mess with other men's vehicles. So I don't know who I pissed off or somebody was jealous or what. They actually carved MS-13 on the hood of my car and put a big scratch. <laughs> it sounds like, I, yeah, I don't think they were jealous. I think they just were representing the hood. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Maybe they knew that you were from Lebanon Cedar originally and they were like not yeah. <laughs> Let it go <laughs> no, back yeah. to that beginning. It's Cedars of Lebanon. Cedars of Lebanon. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I like you represent my my gang. Where are you <laughs> from? Cedars, man. Um no. Yeah, I uh G Gila says actually guys like you totally have Corvettes. And, and she means douchey when she says guys like me, <laughs> <laughs> which I am. I mean, look at me. You're not douchey at all. Don't, don't, don't put that out in the, that energy out in the. Yeah, I, I mean, look You're, how I dress, how I look. It's it's a little douchey, but I'm okay with my doucheyness. I, I uh, embrace it. <laughs> it's, it doesn't have to be a negative thing. Do you to this day, and we'll close out with this. Do you to this day when you go about your day? Uh, is it like, is your intent to make sure that you're matching at least? Because I know that a lot of, you have a lot of clothes, a lot of clothes, and often your clothes, your tops and your bottoms and your shoes are, are all together. Do you, is there ever a day that you don't match? Pez, you should see my underwear and socks. They match you too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like to, to, to match. You know, yeah, I, I have this look and uh, yeah. It is what it is. <laughs> I hope you're wearing deodorant right now because the dog is right be below you. No, okay. she, she left a long time ago. The smell was too much for her. <laughs> no, she's, she's underneath the pool table. That's nice. like her little dog house. Nice. Um, yeah, I don't have uh, any magic words and whatnot, but you can see that I, I'm a I'm a happy person. And if you guys see that, I've done my job. And, you know, one of the keys to my success is with sobriety is I've been very consistent. I've always gone to meetings, always had commitments, sponsor, sponsees, and God. And I love that one. You know, the program, uh, the spirituality in the programs like the, the wet spot of the ocean. Um, yeah, I mean. Love it. I, I, I love my you. life. I love you, Pej. And thank you guys all for watching and watch my YouTube channel and subscribe and like. I'm trying to talk like Jumin in Venice now. Um, <laughs> this comes out. Oh, man. Awesome. Anyway. All right. Very so good Is to have enough? you. Do, do we fill enough airtime? Are you good? No, we're good. We're now I, now my hunger has definitely overtaken everything about me. So I'm gonna go and eat after this. I love you. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you for coming to the Love corner. You You're a good man. Love you too. Thanks for having me. Peace, everybody. Namaste. Love you all. Namaste and namastama makusta. Bye. Hail Satan. <laughs>